Paul J. McBride from Vorath, bass player extraordinaire. How are you doing, man? I'm well, Matt. How are you, sir? No, I'm doing all right. Things could be worse. Uh, had a pretty good Thanksgiving holiday. Everybody seems to be doing well, so I'm doing all right. Tell me what Vorath is up to, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've been um, definitely developing some stuff uh, as far as future releases go. Uh, we have an album, our debut album, actually. Uh, expected out early next year through Exodus Stratagem Records. Uh, we've been working with them for a minute now. They're great dudes. It's, it's a smaller label, but uh, fierce. They're, it's veteran-owned and operated. They have nothing but support for us and the vision that we're going for, um, and they're great people. You know, I don't really know what else you could ask for, even especially in today's current musical climate. Um, so, you know, stoked to be working with them. Uh, we just have a released a song off the forthcoming album uh november 13th judas blood and vultures we've had some pretty good response with that too it's a couple write-ups stuff like that i think we got like ten thousand views in the first week which is always good other than that man we're already thinking about working on the next album and you know future shows and stuff like that too so you know always always something in the fire i'm sure you know yeah man and um i saw the uh, video for judas blood and vultures and I was privileged enough to hear some of your guys' music from your uh, upcoming uh, album. And I didn't find that song on the track listing. So was that something that you guys recorded after the fact? Or was that a song that you had done, just didn't have it uh, finished in time for your album? Is it going to be on there is essentially what I'm asking. It was uh, the newest addition to the album. Um, that was probably the most recently written song. So like when you um, you know were exposed to the tracks, jamming with us, what have you, that wasn't part of it. Um, that was kind of something that we almost maybe spur of the moment. Uh, we just felt like we needed a little bit more material on the debut there. And, uh, you know, just kind of fell into place. I mean, Josh just had a, a vision like he normally does and, and put it into fruition and made it into, you know, the world that we're playing in as Vorath. So it was a, it was a great addition, I think. Nice, dude. And uh, I got to say, your guys' videos – from uh, the newest one, of course, to um, Siren Head, and uh, even the trailers that you guys have done to look uh, outstanding, and to to be able to have that quality of a production is a is kind of a DIY thing, man. You guys are all super creative people, and what is that process like? I mean, who's really the mastermind of all that kind of stuff? And like, what do you guys usually do? Do you guys write storyboards? Like, how does that whole thing come come about? Well, so a little bit of everything, essentially. Um, for the most part, I would say Josh is pretty much the creative mastermind, especially with like the storyline and the lore. Um, Tyler, our guitar player as well, uh, definitely a, a key co contributor as far as, you know, the vision of where the trajectory of the storylines and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, most of that is Josh's brainchild. Uh, he's just a very creative dude. He used to write sci-fi stories and stuff like that too. So this is kind of you know, very much a shoe in comparatively to that. Um, storyboards definitely are a part of it, you know, whatever we can do to get those ideas into like tangible pieces that we can, you know, then create from. Um, but yeah, I mean, we all try to contribute as much as we can, but it's definitely our drummer, Josh, um, who's the, you know, very much the creative brainchild with a lot of that stuff he's very very talented does a lot of the video editing too i mean we get some help from other sources too you know depending on what the funding situation is if there is one which typically there isn't <laughs> so shoestring budget too you know um definitely pleased with how they came out with all those things considered but yeah i mean josh is a wizard dude and he makes it happen regardless of what we have to work with so I, i'm super pleased with it and i think a lot of people that see it or listen to it maybe almost don't believe that we do it with you know with the tools that we have the the minimal um resources that we have currently at our fingertips but hey i mean play the cards you're dealt man you know and uh i feel like we're making it work you know they came out better than i could have ever imagined and i'm really happy with them yeah they look great and i gotta say that i know you guys i'm I got was fortunate enough to play with you guys uh, in in Vorath, filming in for a tour, and on the Rings of Saturn tour that we both did. And you guys uh, definitely make the most of what you got. I mean, t Josh is a wizard, super talented guy, and Tyler is a uh, is a uh, you know he's like the mechanical genius of the uh, of the outfit here. In my in my opinion, anyway. I mean, you guys total team effort. I mean, but you know, it seems like uh, 
Man, with Tyler with uh, string gum popsicle sticks, you know, and the whole nine, you guys can, uh, you know, you guys can make the pyramids or at least something that floats if you have to. So, you know, it's not a surprise that the videos always look so good. And you know, like, um, what's what's different now in this incarnation of Vorath? Like, what's what's different than like how how do you see your guys see yourself you guys moving forward? Um, well, I mean, we've had, you know, as you know, um, and probably, you know, a lot of people that have been following us probably know to some extent we've had a few lineup changes, you know, um, stuff like that. The core members have always remained the same. Um, getting Chelsea on vocals this past year or so was definitely a big game changer as far as even just the, the drive behind, you know, what we want to achieve and just, you know, the vibes and everything too. Um, you know, personnel is everything for sure. Um, and then obviously something that like logistically works out, you know, I know a lot of band members and stuff like that don't all live in the same state or even country and stuff like that too. But, uh, for what we're trying to do and like the availability of all that stuff too, it, it definitely helps that, you know, she's closer as well. And, um, yeah, I mean the future we want to, you know, take the storyboard and the lore further than it's, than it's been, uh, keep creating that. I mean, very much akin to like a video game that is a, ba a metal band, you know, um, we're all big video game nerds and like, you know, Elder Scrolls, stuff like that with immersive lore, Lord of the Ring. I mean, you name it, anything nerdy and uh, immersive. Uh, it's pretty much what we're going for. Um, I mean, getting a, uh, our song in a video game would be awesome, too. I mean, there's really no limit to what we necessarily hope for. Um, definitely some shows, probably some tours and stuff in the next year. Um, you know, more videos as well, too. We have the, the album coming out. Um, so definitely at least a couple more singles off of that. Uh, and then, I mean, whatever else we can, you know, do to further boost the trajectory of the band in a positive and professional way, um, which may be few and far between in the extreme metal world. But, hey, um, I keep <laughs> hoping to think it's out there. No, it is. It is. You just got to know where to look. But, hey. But yeah, I mean, other than that, you know, just what I mean, anybody would hope for in a band that they're passionate about, you know, I want the best for it. And uh, I think that we um, have the tools to achieve that, you know, maybe not today or tomorrow, but hopefully very soon. You know, and uh, absolutely. Get, I'd have to say, because I've seen both sides of the band like the, from different perspectives and getting Chelsea in the band was a huge boost to, to Borat, dude. There's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, she brought a lot to the table. And uh, that being said, dude, like, I think that for this, this the, from where you guys started when I saw you guys on the Rings tour to where you are now, it's definitely, I think it fits the vibe of the, the vibe of the lore better. I think it fits the story overall better. And um, the lore is pretty deep. Like, why don't you talk a little bit about the lore? Because when I first heard this stuff, I was just like, man, this is this is really cool, number one, but just the level of detail that Josh went into, all this stuff is just crazy. So tell us some of the lore, Paul. Okay, so it essentially takes place in the far future, uh, but still in the same location that we all exist in, in like the, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Appalachian region. 80% um, 80 80 of the population has been destroyed. Um, a good way to like sort of jumpstart of like where the scenario is like before I go any further if you if you think of like the video game fallout or like Mad Max and then cross that with like Halo the video game it's kind of like a cross or a mishmash of all those different things um, and that's kind of like where we've sort of become after you know this apocalyptic event uh, essentially the future in that world that we've created is like most sci-fi worlds, pretty dark, bleak, and depraved and hopeless. Um, maybe like three to five, you know, maybe all robber barony type of corporations that are essentially the government that just run everything. Um, they'll hire mercenaries. They'll do whatever they need to do. Um, and then there's these, you know, alien entities, um, almost like godlike creatures, like the Atai and the Kerr. Um, I mean, it's, it's way, way more immersive. Uh, we probably don't even have enough time for me to talk all about that, but, um, yeah, there's celestial powerful beings, there's terrible, corrupt government world corporations, uh, and there's us, Vorath, um, which are just people trying to survive and, you know, find their next meal and make sure their family's safe. Um, and this is the soundtrack essentially to those escapades. Um, and the way it's built, I mean, you can kind of have 
you could kind of go in a lot of directions with it. I don't want to say like the walking dead, but like that maybe sort of model as you travel, meet new people, you know, other people come and go and what have you, whatever the case may be, new gods appear, new corporations. I mean, it's a very big, open, broad palette that we have to work with, but there's a lot of specific detail within that. Um, each member of the band sort of almost even having, I don't want to say an origin story, but it, it all makes sense as to why we are who we are in the band and what's going on within the storyline uh, thereof. So uh, we definitely plan on doing like a graphic novel and some more immersive stuff with the lore too, outside of just what a traditional band would do, which I think would really help um, get people involved with that too. Because what I being a huge nerd, I mean, I know Matt, you're kind of in the same boat too. That's why we get along so well. And really, anybody that gives a crap about extreme metal, you're probably a nerd in some way. Sorry, hey, let's admit it. Um, but like the lore of like immersive RPGs or uh, a good science fiction novel or a video game, it's really that storyline and that escapism that you align with or relate to, and that's really what we're trying to bring with the music. I mean. You know, hopefully the mu people like the music too, because I, I think it's rad as hell. Um, but you know, if we don't get them with that, maybe we'll get them with the storyline and vice versa, and you know, pull them in either way. It's just I feel like they cater and lend themselves so well to one another. Um, it's you know, it's hopefully a recipe for something um, enticing for the listener. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, and I think in today's day and age in the music business, I mean, because it is a business, I think any way that you can. Um, broaden your audience like having the lore thing like you referenced the walking dead but in all actuality it's kind of like you know having a wide open uh world to to work in is a good thing and not being stuck to some rigid kind of an idea you know the idea of people coming in and out you know different characters enter the story then leave and then actually having you know a background to your own character is really cool i remember uh if memory serves me correct like that your character you know reflects your personality to a certain degree and that's yes. really really cool and so that being said it's like you know you if i could be wrong but you were like a like a uh, like a wizard like not a wizard but some sort of intellectual because you're a smart guy and you are a nerd just like the rest of us so it all kind of like ties <laughs> yeah. together is that an accurate thing it's very accurate actually um I, I think in more um crude terms it would be like i'm kind of the the only Yankee in the band, everybody else, you know, from North Carolina to some degree. I mean, Chelsea's from Florida too, but I lived in Florida for like 30 years, which South Florida is essentially like an inverted, you know, New England. Um, so a lot of my mannerisms and stuff like that are a bit different than like Josh's and Tyler's stuff. I mean, you know, we're just different regions. So writing that sort of like Yankee mentality into my character as in like, yeah, I came from a distant area. I was exiled, um, you know, may or may not have been donned some extra um sort of powers or abilities um i mean that's kind of all still to be un unraveled and um determined in the storyline as it expands but yes um we all find our way in this area of the u.s that we currently are in uh, but i'm just <laughs> not originally from there so yes what you're saying is maybe not like a wizard but like different than the rest of everybody but still a mercenary for hire with you know special traits and character abilities dude it reminds me of the stand kind of that thing where everybody's like from different places and they converge to one area you know and they like that whole thing it's kind of like that. that's a great it's a great analogy that's a great great read too freaking uh so as you had mentioned you're from florida Let's talk about that. I know that you you know uh, you worked with Derek Roddy for a while. Let's talk about that. How was that whole experience, man? I remember you saying that he was pretty prolific, and you know he taught you a, a lot of different lessons about the music business. So, like, what's that all about? Absolutely. Um, I am just always super grateful the time I had playing with Derek. We were uh, we did multiple projects for about over a, a three year time frame. Uh, one in particular that comes to mind is uh, Fire for Effect, which was like actually the last recording that the late great brett hoffman the singer of malevolent creation did before his untimely passing um and that's uh, available online if you for some reason get a wild hair and want to look it up anybody that's listening um but yeah playing with derek was it changed the way i see myself as a player um one of the big things he taught me was to focus on yourself as the player and not the band that you're in 
not that the band that you're in isn't important. It absolutely is. But if people like learn who you are, the player like Paul McBride, you know, good bass player, Matt Miller, amazing guitar player, or, you know, Josh Ward, amazing drummer, Derek Roddy, great drummer. If they know you as the, the individual, whatever you're aligned with in the future, doesn't matter. will always garner that attention. Um, and I think a lot of bass players, especially in heavy metal, the, the actual bass players, the 50 of us on the planet that exist, um, we have a tendency to like hide behind the shadow of the band. Whereas you have to completely change the way you think about how you see yourself in a, a professional musical application, if that's what you want to do. Uh, but that, that changed it for me. And then also you mentioned his, how prolific he is. I mean, he's been on so many records. He, played on a blotted science record he was like one of 11 people to try out for dream theater when mike portnoy originally left and now he's back which is amazing um a lot of the times like trusting your gut especially when you're recording something you can get stuck in like a nitpicking whirlwind where you'll never be able to like recreate that initial energy that you had when you like just sat down and cranked it yes you want to edit yes you want to make sure it's perfect but like there's still something to be said about that initial energy and intuition that you have and i think a lot of that gets lost sometimes with like modern daws and studio applications and stuff like that definitely having that identity behind what you're doing still using technology as a tool but don't use it to define your sound and sound like everyone else i mean he has a huge identity behind the kit i mean anything you listen to in his um catalog you i mean you already know it's him because you're listening to it for that reason but it's very you know, his sound stands out it's very defining you know a lot of the greats are that way too i always felt like if you can't tell who that is within 30 seconds i don't know if they're doing their job well enough you know but having that identity behind it which he has i mean he's made a career off of it and you know nothing but respect for sure he gave me a lot of great opportunities playing professionally and stuff like that too we made some of the sickest music i've done uh, we have a record that's available on like spotify and stuff when uh, we were called ends ends i was short-lived but packed quite a punch man um we did a couple other things too another um not to carry on here but we did another project called band horde that we've been used somewhat to and has like over 150 different artists on it um you know kevin tal uh yeah kevin tally from we used to play for dying fetus um i believe lord marco's on it um some ex-members of like uh morbid angel I, I believe uh i mean there's so many people i don't want to misquote who's on there derek's on there i did bass on one full record it's three it's a three uh record release it's been in the making for like six years at this point um but that should be coming out hopefully in the next couple of years too so that's cool um but yeah long story short derek is nothing but professional just changed the way I saw myself as a musician. And he opened my eyes to a lot of tools that I already had at my advantage that I didn't even know how to use. Um, and I'm nothing but grateful for the time that we had, man. He's a, he's a great dude as well as he's just as cool and understanding as he is as a fucking amazing drummer. So, I mean, if you think about that for a second, you know, they don't really make them like that anymore. So. No, that is super rare where you, you know, you find people that, uh, that are their talent is reflected in their personality is they're good people you know that's not always the case and i think when you see like when we see that especially when it's people that we do respect and revere that they're you know that they're they're humble and they have some humility that goes a long way with liking their art too in my opinion like you know if i like somebody's Absolutely. music and they're kind of an asshole you know i still like their music but it just kind of ruins it a little bit you know what i mean and not to take away from their art, but it's like it's like trying to you know not be like relatable in some way. You know what I mean? When you talk about these people that are you know, like Derek Roddy or you know Gene Hoglin or pick all these great drummers and or the fifth the forty nine other bass players that are all employed, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like these are good people. You know, they're good musicians and they're they're decent people. It makes it makes it a lot cooler. But um, you know, you guys, I think your guys' last show, excuse me, was at Michigan Metal Fest. Let's talk about that. How was that whole experience? Was that pretty rad? It was a great experience, actually. Steve Maple and the rest of the guys who put it on were nothing but kind and uh, hospitable. Um, we had a blast. The weather was rad. It didn't rain like it did last year. Uh, and they asked us, I believe they asked us back to play next year, too. So we look forward to playing it again in 2024. 
Uh, Born of Osiris was awesome. Upon a Burning Body was awesome. Cultist Black was awesome. Raven Black was tight. Um, Casket Robbery, great people and a great band. They played awesome too. Um, Psycho Stick, you know, brought it. It was just a great lineup of, again, just cool people too. It definitely helps when you're, um, when you, you know, you're, 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 you vibe with somebody when you chill, you know, they're chill. Yeah, it's like any sort of other working relationship. When you get along with your coworkers, it's a lot better environment. You know what I mean? I agree. I agree. Heavy metal is notorious for like not providing that, but I don't know. I feel like we we do all right. So, well, yeah, it was a great experience, and I look forward to playing next year for sure. It gets bigger every year, and we're just stoked to be a part of it, man. It was it was rad. No, that is cool, dude. And did you guys get to play any shows on your way there or on your way back, or did you guys just go up there and knock it out and take off? We played one show in Indiana, I believe, um, with Casket Robbery. We kind of were thrown on last minute, so we had sort of a short set, and there was, you know, I don't know. You know how I feel about Indiana. It was, it was good for what it was, Casket Robbery, great people. They played great. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know. It is what it is, and let's talk about Indiana. <laughs> let's talk about that whole thing. So, Paul, what do you remember about Indiana the last time you were, the second to the last time you were there? Oh, yeah, when we played um, that Rings tour, yeah, that was um, that was a time. Um, and not to let me get a prerequisite here. I'm sure Indiana has some great redeeming qualities. John Cougar Mellencamp is a sweetheart and should be protected at all costs. Um, every show experience I've had in Indiana has been subpar to overstate it, quite frankly. The, I, th I believe you're referring to the Emerson Theater, Matt, that we played on the Rings tour. Is that is that the one you're talking about? That's what I'm talking about. It had a uh, no AC or running water, if I do remember correctly. Yes, uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, they didn't turn down the house music at all, even during sound check. Um, a lot of the staff were just, you know, running out, having shots in between songs, which is fine. One of these, any one of these things we mentioned by themselves standalone is just like, Hey, that's showbiz, you know, rock and roll. We've toured a lot. Nothing's ever going to be picture perfect. And that's fine. We improvise, we adapt, we overcome. We're not playing like top 40 pop classics. You know what I mean? We're playing an underground extreme niche form of heavy metal, which we love to death. But I mean, that's, let's you know very few make it to that huge like everybody owns a yacht and we're playing madison square garden that is possible and uh, we get it, but we're not there yet a lot of bands aren't you got to pay your dues but so if any one of those things happened it would be okay but there was just like it was a chain a series of events of 13 different ones that were terrible the water and the ac definitely was a big part of it considering it was like one of the hottest heat waves in recorded modern history um, I believe they stiffed us on the pay at the end of the day too. Um, they, I, when we pulled up, they were pulling the uh, monitor wedges out of like the sound guy, the sound guys Honda Civic, saying like, "Oh, I think these will work." And I knew at that moment I was like, "Tonight is going to be rough," you know. Hey, but I, I, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't even put on our costumes in that show. It was so hot, we just played in gym shorts and like Bucky's t-shirts and just went in. I feel like that was one of our better nights performing playing wise. We were just kind of pissed and on one and we bottled that anger and delivered it to the 10 people um, that were there, which I think, you know, that one guy in the cowboy hat and the other merch guys really dug our set. So it was definitely, it was fun. <laughs> I, I remember uh, being told that the last time somebody was there, I can't remember who said they were there. It used to be a theater and it had like a, uh, a slanted floor where the chairs were and they poured a concrete pad in that building that must have been like four feet thick you know what i mean to level that whole thing out it was crazy and i remember uh they had no water but they had plenty of white claw i remember that and i remember i remember going in the bar next door and we're like every there's like 20 of us sitting in this bar just you know delirious from the heat because it was hot and uh you know i remember walking in and seeing like the shopping cart and the fluorescent light tubes and the in the uh, entrance way and like the bathroom had like malaria and shit you know it was it was it was crazy you know, like the the lights the wiring was all sketchy and stuff like but i'd say the best part of that whole time being there is when we got to jam a little bit you know before the show started that was really cool and uh you know remember josh outside doing like karate chopping bricks like breaking bricks with his hand because there was like nothing else to do 
it, it, yeah. you know, it was, it was that, that was fun, man. That was a good experience. But yeah, Indiana, um, you know, it reminds me of like, uh, it was probably part of the Rust Belt, you know, that what that means and everything like that. But like, it was like, it was like, like, it was like, like uh, turning from like solid rock getting green, dude. Like everything was just like, like dilapidated something that like you think of like mold. It wasn't moldy. It was just like crumbly. That's what I'd say. Indiana was crumbly when, when in that place anyway. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, like I said, I'm sure Indiana has some beautiful sights to see and venues to play at. And the people there, I'm sure, are pleasant and, you know, fine, upstanding citizens. <laughs> Every experience I've had in Indiana in the extreme metal circuit has been not really desirable. So, but hey, you know, maybe that'll change. Maybe that'll change and something else will happen. As of right now, not a huge fan. You know, the lady at the bar, she was cool. And everybody in the bar was awesome. I mean, that was the place to be. And, you know, they were like, we're the only ones with AC in the whole town. You know, so it was <laughs> like, a, they got the keys to the kingdom, man. I remember. Exactly. It was, like the, it was like the community center, like the Roman Plaza or whatever. But yeah, it was really cool. And <laughs> Paul, uh, speaking of uh, like literally really cool, and the whole place was super freaking hot. But, um, you know, uh, you've also toured with a band. I can't remember their name. I'm just, it's it's escaping me. That uh, you guys toured with Fear Factory. What was that like, dude? What was was that your first national tour? Yeah, that was uh, the band you're referring to is Before the Morning. M O U R I N G. Oh, M O U R N I N G. I'm sorry, I can't spell. Uh, that was in like 2014, 2015. That was actually, I would say, probably my first official professional. Um, heavy metal bass playing experience we did a five-week tour in support of fear factory we had a record that was released on century media records um a little bit of airplay on uh liquid metal serious at uh, xm our manager at the time was john berklin who used to play for devil driver now plays for bad wolves uh, which you know they're doing some pretty amazing things um i mean that was an eye-opening experience too i mean i almost really had no idea how the industry worked and you, you're very much like the band's gonna make it you know screw you dad homework sucks kind of thing and then you know i i bought my own ticket to la didn't know any of them just kind of flew out there willy-nilly and uh figured it out man but you know that's kind of how rock and roll is so it was an opportunity i got and i knew if i said no i'd regret it my whole life i did it and it changed it changed my life man some those are some great memories for sure Touring with Fear Factory was awesome, too. I mean, what a professional band um, at the time. Burton was still singing for them, and I actually became very good friends with Mike Heller, their drummer, who I still talk to to this day, man. Uh, just a fantastic, talented human being uh, and drummer. Just a great guy. That's awesome. Yeah. Another one of those... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I apologize. I was pretty much done. Sorry, I apologize. Oh, another one of those dudes that's super talented, but a good dude. You know what I mean? One of yeah. you know, I and I'm sure that's more common with like drummers and, and uh, bass players. I think the egomaniacs are probably the vocalists and the guitar players are the ones that probably <laughs> have the have the ego. Well, problems. I mean, we definitely have our fair share. It's our, like our own unique brand of like megalomaniacal individuals. <laughs> um, but a lot of us are just like such weirdos that we got to stick together because I mean who else is gonna like listen or make it happen so uh but yeah i mean i've i don't know i've always as a bass player it's i've always felt it's good to um be involved with talented drummers especially in a in a heavy metal application because i always felt like and i'm sure you agree too i mean being as talented as you are on guitar but in a metal band if your drummer sucks your band sucks i mean that's just cut and dry how it is and since there's such that deep connection with drum and bass, maybe not in a lot of modern metal bands because, you know, they phone it in or they have their younger brother play guitar or something or they program it. But there's a deep connection there, too. And I, I feel like it can really just do wonders for a band as a whole when you have that bass player drummer connection. And they're both on the same level, you know, and same like ideals and, you know, maybe even similar abilities. Who knows? absolutely dude and that's one thing i do have to say is that you know josh is a great drummer he really is and he's a hell of a nice guy he's super talented he plays guitar really well too i mean talented dude and uh your guys is uh locked it in was really good dude i noticed that and that was one thing is you guys had um, you know familiarity of course is a part of it but like uh 
subconscious connection like you would even know like when the when the changes were coming like that just not because he played it before but like you knew instinctively like how he played and you guys really did have a good uh, symbiotic relationship musically where it just seemed like you were able to catch every little thing that he was doing because in my opinion like josh would would you know what he would he he elaborates really cool on stuff live and so like getting to actually play the set with him like um it was kind of like I was always had to be on my toes to see what, what he was going to do because it was the same. But like for somebody from the outside looking in, it was like, unless I, you know, it would, it would take a while to catch everything that guy was doing because it was it's subtle, you know, subtle and not just, you know, the basic stuff. So that was one thing I did notice was that your guys' musical conversation was really, really, really strong, especially when we were jamming on stuff just for fun. It was really cool to see that, man. Awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, John, I mean, when when someone's like a talented player at that level, it just makes everything really easy. Um, I always feel like, you know, if you're the most talented musician in the room, you're probably teaching then, or you're in the wrong room, you know, or maybe both. Um, so just being around people of that level definitely helps me grow as a player too. I'm trying to keep up, you know. Sometimes I feel like I do an all right job, but hey, um, they haven't fired me yet. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, just being into the same types of music and like the ideals that hold strong in those bands that we know and love and respect and grew up with transposing that into your own identity and then jamming that with somebody and like sharing that experience with them. You're all, you're, you're almost having like similar thoughts. You know what I mean? You can kind of expect that they're going to go that way or do this or like where their head is at. Um, and obviously just like being in a band with them for, you know, several years at this point too, it, it only helps the process. The more you like learn and are around with somebody and like in that creative process with them, you can kind of see where they're at and like what like room you're operating in with them. And you try to get the keys to the same room that they're in so you can hang out too, you know? Absolutely, dude. Like, you know, like you were saying, there's a uh, familiar things in the style of music that we play. Like, you know, you expect certain things to be played. Or like, you know what I mean? You kind of have a clue how it's going to go. You know, yeah. especially, especially if you've had to, you know, compose music and thinking for other instruments or this and that. So, and Josh has done a lot of that. And, uh, you know, that's that's a huge strength is having somebody in a band that's, you know, thinking all you guys are thinking of, of from other people's perspectives. And I think it makes really good music because your guys' style is unique. It's not just like a, like a black metal thing. It's not just like a death metal thing. It's like, you know, you guys have a really, really interesting style or even incorporates some of the music ge geographically from where you guys are from, you know, a lot of the stuff that has like the open tunings and the drones, that was really cool, especially some of the acoustic parts that are on the record you guys have coming out. I can't remember the name of the songs, but that was something that was really interesting was that it ref the, mu the re music reflected, you know, kind of like your guys's cultural thing too. So that was really, really, really cool. And that's what made you guys unique in my opinion. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, first of all, it's awesome that you knew that and noticed that not a lot of people pick up on that, although we haven't been around maybe long enough for that to really happen. But um, there is definitely a cultural like Appalachia uh, vibe to it, you know, um, we don't have any banjos or anything going on. Maybe not yet, uh, but there's definitely like a mountain folk, you know, Highlander, like hill people kind of thing going on. Um, and, and like and I mean that in the best possible way. I mean, it's just it's a whole ecosystem and culture that I'm just getting caught up to speed with, you know, having lived in um, the Asheville area for about three years now at this point. I mean, Josh, Tyler, Dan, I mean, they've lived here their whole life. So, I mean, it's part of who they are. And seeing that um, transposed into like tangible music that we're creating for the general populace is like a beautiful thing, man. Um, I don't know of a better way to like uphold tradition or like build a legacy for yourself as a musician than, you know, incorporating those themes, um, in a, in just such a creative way, you know? Oh, absolutely, dude. And like, I got to spend a little bit of time in Nashville. It's a nice city. I'm sure that, uh, you know, coming from Florida, it's probably a somewhat of a relief living there. I mean, Florida was pretty intense. I've only been there a few times, but it was it was yeah. interesting, man. So what's the what's the difference between living in Florida and living in Nashville? Like, what's the main difference, man? Uh, a lot of positives. I like to uh, speak ill of Florida, and it does have a lot of pitfalls. But at the end of the day, it 
made me who I am as a, a bass player in the extreme metal circuit, you know? Um, Florida essentially invented death metal, in my opinion. And a lot of the, you know, tried and true, like, purveyors and OGs and even, you know, new up-and-comers and stuff like that, we we carry that torch very firmly. And uh, I, we take it pretty seriously in a lot of ways. I mean, there's very few things Floridians take seriously. But when you give a shit about heavy metal, I can promise you that that's something that they take very, very seriously. Um, and that just, it, it built a respect for me for the craft doing that. Um, I met a lot of, or, I mean, a good amount of, you know, talented players, some amazing players too, but a lot of the thing with Florida, just geographically, it's tough. I mean, most tours like OzFest, Warp Tour, all the big tours and other ones that have come and gone and newer ones coming, usually like South Florida, where I used to live in the Tri-County area, Fort Lauderdale, you know, like uh, an hour from Miami, that would either be like the first or the last destination on the tour. Um, so, I mean, it's like an eight hour drive from the state line. So, I mean, unless you had guaranteed, um, gigs in and out, I mean, a lot of people just overlooked it. Um, and I mean, that is a pitfall as far as being a musician down there. You kind of have to get out and like spread your wings and like show people what you got. We are almost like kind of sharpening your sword in a vacuum. People don't even know who you are. And then you come out into the world and they're like, who the hell is this? Um, so it like. You know, it kind of like makes you tough and strong, at least in like the metal circuit, in my opinion, at least. Um, but as far as the difference goes, I mean, I, I got a lot of great opportunities as soon as I moved from Florida, probably like within the first year, um, which was, you know, a big game changer. Um, less traffic. Somehow the cost of living here is even cheaper than Florida, which is crazy. Uh, the people are nicer overall. I mean, maybe that's just the South thing as a whole. But getting a firm handshake and eye contact when you meet somebody and them not trying to, like, sell you some stuff to shine your tires or some fake cardboard speakers out of the back of a van. Like, very less in agendas is great. Um, the actual change of seasons, like getting a little bit of snow and some winter weather is nice, too. Uh, is nice as well. Which always made me think of, it was like a Morbid Angel uh, video or review or maybe like the insert of a CD or something years ago. Where it's like, that's why all the crazy death metal came out of Florida, because like every day is just a hot, swampy, nightmarish hellscape that just drives you crazy. And that's just how that crazy, intense, insane, awesome music was, 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 you know, spurned just in a, a pressure cooker of psychosis and alligators. Yeah, man, like it's a... Uh hot and then it's raining real hard and then it's hot again it's intense down there man it, it is a hellscape it's like the uh i mean it's kind of like you know like norway with all the black metal dudes you know it's kind of like an extreme place where extreme people equals extreme metal dude you know yeah. it's very much like that but um you know the uh, the hot end not the cold end yes I agree. right i agree i agree i mean there's cool things about florida too i would recommend visiting but i lived there for like 30 years it just kind of People that live in Vegas probably feel the same way. When you like grow up in a tourist town, it you kind of it kind of messes with like your identity of who you are. Um, but I do miss the seafood dearly. Absolutely miss the seafood more than anything. The beaches too. I mean, the Treasure Coast has some of the nicest beaches in uh, the United States of America, in my opinion. And I will die on that hill. Um, not a whole lot much else that I miss aside from my family and friends. Um, you know, but uh, I definitely would look forward to going to Flanagan's again and maybe eating some steamed swordfish or something like that. So <laughs> Nice, man. That does sound good. So when should we expect the Vorath album to be released? I would say uh, we're currently projecting like January, maybe February. So I would say early um, next year, within the next few months at the latest. Uh, we'll probably have another single come out as well with that release. Uh, but everything's, you know, cut and printed, and we're just uh, behind the start line here, waiting for that gun to fire, and then we'll we're off to the races, you know. As you know how it goes with album cycles, so you know probably some some touring in support of it, um, some new merch, you know, the whole nine yards. Any more uh, barbecue sauce in that merch run? Yes, absolutely. That was uh, pun intended, a hot item. Uh, we sold out of that pretty quick, um, and that's Tyler's like family recipe. So, um, as 
fast as he can make it is as fast as we usually sell that stuff. But we definitely plan on making more of the regular and hot variant of the Vorath barbecue sauce. Um, yeah, everybody, everybody just really like that's weird. You take a you, you kind of take a dice roll with the random merch items. I always feel like every band should have like at least hidden very one hidden variable like offshoot weird merch item to like stand out. And we did that with the barbecue sauce, and it, man, it worked out great. We sold. We had twelve cases of that thing. We sold out of that in like a few months or so. Yeah, that was a hot item. Unintended. I remember when you guys were throwing <laughs> bottles of that stuff uh, on the on the tour that I was a part of with you guys. But uh, that's cool. We look forward to hearing that release, dude. And uh, you know, your guys' this music's awesome. You guys release quality content. And uh, you're gonna have another single. Will it be a video as well, or just the single? It will have a video. We're gonna try to make sure we have correlating visual media, um, at least from a lore perspective, with at least every up and coming release um, in the near projected future. Um, it just not only an effort to further build the lore and expand that, but to give the listener something more as well. Too, uh, we're just um, excuse me. Yeah, so short answer, yes. <laughs> we are probably going to have a video with pretty much every release um, if we can help it. So Nice, man. Is that a track that's already been on the EP, or is that will that be something that's, or excuse me, not the EP, but the LP, or is that a new track, or is it one that you guys have already had? It'll be a track that's um, on the uh, debut release coming up. All right, cool, awesome, man. Looking forward to hearing it. Paul, is there anything that you'd like to say before we go? Uh, that's pretty much it, man. Um, I mean, it was always a pleasure, you know, hanging with you on tour and the time that we played together. You're a great player, man. And you've had a lot of cool opportunities come up recently too. I know you did that possessed tour and stuff like that. And, uh, I don't know. I look forward to hearing everything that you released, man, cause you're a hell of a player and it's just exciting to me. And I, I think a lot of people want to hear more myself included. Well, thank you, Paul. And likewise, dude, uh, Always a good time hanging out with you, and I'm looking forward to what you guys are doing too. And I wish you nothing but the all the success that you guys rightfully deserve, and you're working hard for. And uh, you know, you're a good friend of mine, and value your friendship. And tell everybody I said hello. But Paul, I'm going to let Likewise. you go. Have an awesome rest of your night, and uh, talk to you soon, dude. You as well, Matt. Be well. Be safe. <laughs>